Guardian will be available on our South Guardian um, partnership website. Um, so you can go back and watch this at any time. Um, and as I do say, it's being recorded. Um, if you can all just please um, keep your cameras and your cameras turned off and your mic muted for us throughout the session, this will just then um, alleviate any buffering or, or any holdups. Um, yes, so first of all, then I'm going to pass over to um, Zoe. Um, yeah, so welcome, Zoe. Thank you very much. Would you mind putting it onto slideshow, Kerry? Can you do that? Thank you. And can I have the next slide, please? Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. I'm Zoe Gilbert. I'm the Service Development Lead for CAMS. Um, so we're going to just um, go through the CAMS services today. Um, obviously, this is um, all the some reading speed. Is that on my, oh, my cam? Yeah, I can't hear you properly, Zoe. I don't know if anybody else can. I think we had a little bit. Should we just go? Do you want to just carry on, Zoe, and we'll see yeah. if we can hear you? Okay, we'll do. Okay, so this will be sliding um, just to demonstrate um, the services that we're going to be uh, talking about today. Um, we obviously um, work on a tiered um, system, which obviously we've, we move away from the tiers now, but it's easier just for, for explanation. So the, um, the presentation today is around the services that are in the circle. So that's the CAM service, which you'll know as a tier three provision, along with learning disabilities. And there's a whole heap of services that actually fall within the CAMS portfolio, which we'll, we'll go through. And then we're going to talk to you as well about tier three and a half, which is ICAMS, and about how they integrate with tier four, which is inpatient um, intervention. OK, so the next slide, please. OK, so this slide on the left hand side is a very, very quick snapshot of all the services that fall under the CAMS portfolio. So all these services sit at tier three level. Um, so um, obviously we can provide greater detail on each one of these, but we've got um, within CAMS, we've got the core CAMS team, which obviously is, is the, the team in the middle of the circle. And within that team, we've got a youth offending uh, worker. We've got a dedicated learning disabilities team, um, which is also for moderate to severe presentations. We've got um, ICAMS that obviously sits as the next, next team up from CAMS. We've got an under fives clinic for not to fives. We've got the neurodevelopmental clinics um, within that portfolio. We've got um, the flash service, which many of you will be familiar with as the fostering looked after adoptive support hub. Um, and that focuses on placement stability. And we've got a therapeutic um, offer going into what started as Red Ruth, but has actually now broadened out across uh, most of the residential settings in Warsaw. We've got a dedicated pan trust eating disorder service. And quite recently, we've repurposed our GP liaison service so that they unfortunately should have been working in the GP practices as of um, February, but that has been delayed. And they're obviously doing that service over the telephone at the moment. All of those services are underpinned by the CAMS medical team. So obviously, we've got dedicated um, psychiatrists that work with us in the CAMS team. Um, and they will cover children that fit within all of those teams if they need to be seen by a medic. So what we're going to do is we're going to concentrate mainly on the core CAMS offer. And if anybody needs anything else relating to the other offers, please just let us know. We can we can answer any questions on that. Um, so in terms of the core CAMS team, we currently accept referrals for young people up to the age of 17, which we know is an anomaly. Um, most CAMS services are up to 18. Um, up to 18, we can accept a referral for the youth offending, for flash, for eating disorders or for learning disabilities. So basically, it's any part of the service other than that that fits within core CAMS. But um, what we can tell you is that there is an ongoing business case and it is set to be moved to the next stage to move CAMS up to 18. And we are, fingers crossed, hopeful that, that will start to come into play for next year. Next slide, please. OK, so in terms of who can refer into CAMS, obviously we are a specialist service 
Um, so those who can refer are um, quite a prescribed um, set of uh, professionals. So we've got GPs, paediatricians, social services, but only qualified social workers. Um, school health, but they come through the paediatric panel, and that's um, a panel, a multi-agency panel that we sit on every Friday to discuss referrals that don't fit with CAMS or need to come into CAMS from different agencies. Um, we've got a direct pathway from, G, um, from WPH counselling. We obviously accept referrals from our own positive steps team if they need to be stepped up. And um, obviously we work collaboratively with any other CAM service in the country if a child moves um, into our areas. In terms of referral criteria, um, as I said, we are at the moderate to severe end of the scale. So um, although these just appear as, as words and presentations on the screen, we would be looking at the more severe end of each one of these presentations. So depression, the self-harm, psychosis, eating disorders, um, the list is endless. And if ever you're uncertain, it's always best to speak to the duty worker to um, actually um, ascertain whether CAMS is the right service for the child that you want to refer in. Next slide, please. OK, so in terms of the team, um, it's a massive team um, over the last five years because we've been under the local transformation plan. It's actually trebled in size. Um, we know a team of about 100 in Warsaw, 80 of those are clinicians and they are made up um, of, of this list on the left hand side, which is nursing, psychology, psychotherapy, family therapy, family support workers, OTs. Uh, various mental health practitioners, social workers, speech and language, um, of which we um, actually buy in that provision and she works within our team. And obviously we have our administrators of which we, we couldn't do what we do without. Um, so in terms of um, information that's relevant to tell you about CAMS, um, there is a duty worker available in CAMS um, every day from nine till five. We encourage anybody to use the duty system. So if you've got a query or a question that you want answering or you're not quite sure whether it's the right service for the child that you want to refer in, please give the duty worker a call and they'll go through the presentation of the child and um, explain to you what the, the correct referral pathway is or um, what the best strategies are for you to use, etc. Um, also, if you've got a child that's quite um, demonstrating an urgent presentation or you feel maybe in crisis, this is still the correct route for you to use. So always use the duty worker uh, initially. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, we've now got GP liaison. Um, we've always had GP liaison, but actually the way in which we'd got it working previously um, needed to be adapted slightly. So um, once we are through COVID, uh, the plan is that we will have two mental health practitioners in the GP practices. And how that will work is if a young person is seen by a GP and they need to have CAMS access, they will be able to be booked into a slot with a, G, with a CAMS um, practitioner um, at the surgery and seen in that safe place rather than them coming straight into CAMS um, initially. It's a way of streamlining uh, referrals into the service. Um, we have a priority pathway available for a young person needing any urgent support. So again, if a GP was to see a young person and they are um, needing urgent attention, um, we can see that young person typically within four hours. We keep a priority slot available with our ICAMS team, preferably, um, but also with our senior clinicians in the team if needs be. Um, it can be that some days we have more than one. So if ICAMS are out on the ward, the core CAMS team will actually see young people also. Um, as I mentioned previously, we have CAMS workers that sit on the paediatric panel um, and this has been really beneficial in Warsaw. So some time ago we gave um, the, the, our word to the GPs basically that we would never reject a referral back to them. Um, what that means is now that if we have referrals coming to CAMS through the single point of access and they don't fit with the CAMS criteria, our staff will take them to the paediatric panel where school nursing, um, the paediatricians, etc 
cetera, et cetera, um, are also uh, based and they will move the referrals between the services um, where they most appropriately need to go. And it might be that sometimes we would pass a referral back to school nursing because it's more appropriate, but then somewhere along the line that come back into CAMS and that, that, that's quite a normal thing to happen. Um, referrals that come into the service are screened daily, um, so no referral is ever left and obviously they're screened by the duty worker each day and um, we prioritise, um, we work on a rag rating system. So we have some presentations, for example, an eating disorder or a psychotic patient would be read and we see those immediately. Um, and we have an amber and a green for those that we think can wait a little bit longer and that's how we move our waiting lists around. Um, it's also an opportunity for the duty worker to identify which service a referral needs to go into. So not always are they suitable for core cams. They may need positive steps or they may need flash for an example. So we will move them where they need to go. But there is just that one single point of access for referrals to come into. Um, all young people who are accepted into cams are seen within 12 weeks. And that's for a first assessment. Now that's a national KPI. Um, we never ever touch 12 weeks for a first assessment. It is usually no longer than eight, um, but where we can, we will get young people seen straight away. And that's really important for us to do that because if a young person is, is bubbling and the chances are if we leave them for the 12 weeks, they'll need an, um, an urgent referral instead. So it's best we see them um, and assess them and determine whether they can wait or not. And we'll take the necessary process that needs to be undertaken. Um, and just to say that a young person can access numerous pathways within CAMS, so it's not always clear cut that a young person will come in and just follow the um, generic core CAMS pathway. It could be that a young person comes in and needs to, act to access multiple clinics, for instance. So it's quite common for a young person to have ADHD and ASD, for example, and need to access both clinics. It's very common for a young person to have an eating disorder and need family therapy. So they can sit in several areas of the team. And obviously it goes without saying as well that they, they can also access a core CAMS um, intervention as well as needing to be seen by a medic as well. Um, the current waiting time for first assessment to treatment. So obviously we'll have seen them within that first 12 weeks and then um, to wait for treatment. At the moment we are um, breaching 12 months. Um, and this is really, really disappointing for us as a team because as most of you will know, we got our waiting lists all the way down to less than three months this time last year. Um, and due to capacity issues and the number of referrals coming through the doors, we are um, back up to uh, to 53 weeks, as you can see there. Um, in terms of the waiting list, what I always say to people is never just take the number on the page. Every child is uh, deserving of a conversation. So um, if you think that a young person needs to come in and you're thinking, oh, what's the point? It's 53 weeks. 53 weeks wait, it's worth you having a conversation with the duty worker because we may be able to bring them in quicker if they're presented in a certain way. Uh, next slide, please. Jackie, over to you. You're on mute, Jackie. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Ah, thank you. Okay, so I'm going to talk about how I can too. And it's echoing, so I hate this. Okay, so the ICAMS team are. Sorry, I can't do that. Okay, is that better? So our ICAM service is our, what we call our crisis service. So if you can see on the left hand side of the screen, our crisis service has got five members of the team there. Two are leads, and that's Delta and Leanne. And the other three are our band six nurses. Now, who can refer to ICAMs? So as you can see on the right hand side, it's the general practitioners, hospital based paediatricians and CAMS team internally can all refer into our ICAMS teams. The, um, and as you can see as well, the paediatricians, social services, school health visitors, children with learning disabilities and WPH counselling service can also do that. The idea of our 
ICAMS crisis services, it's an add-on to our CAMS, generic CAMS service. And these are for the children that cause more concern than um, normally do within the CAMS service. Can you go on to the next slide, Zoe, so I can explain? Right, OK. So what did the team offer? So the team offer crisis and home treatment service. So the team worked from eight o'clock in the morning till eight o'clock of the night, and they even work Christmas Day. So it's every single day of the year. So we know that if anybody's needs are in a crisis or they need support, then this is the team that we refer to. They respond to deliberate self-harms at the hospital and we have a four hour waiting time and we have to respond within that time. So what normally happens if a child does go to A&E, what will happen is the ward will then contact us and the clock, clock starts ticking and we have to make sure we have been assessed the child on the ward with those, within those four hours and did a mental health um, assessment to make sure the child's either fit to be returned home with a good care plan in place or the child will be kept on the ward. And that's a discussion between the ICAM service, the medic and the ward themselves. And obviously if social services or anybody else is involved, we do like to include them in that decision making for that. Um, ex um, we accept referrals up to four o'clock. At the moment, it's up to six o'clock because of COVID. We've extended it slightly. Um, and that's because we don't want children being kept in hospital unnecessarily. We want to get them in and out so that I can then can go and support within the home setting. Or if they're already known to CAMS, we'll involve the key worker in putting up a, a good care plan together so we can make sure that the child is well managed within the community setting and that we support the parents and other professionals that we need to inform of what's gone on. So we provide intensive home treatment for the young people when they come out of hospital. And this is really important and we say for the young person, but it's just as important to make sure the parents are kept up to date with everything and the parent does feel able to manage these young children. So we also have priority slots. So what we're encouraging people to do, so if a GP found us up today and they had a child they're really concerned about, we don't want them sent to A&E unless they've taken an overdose or severe self-harm where it needs medical input. We ask them to contact us at CAMS and then we put them into a priority slot for our ICAMS team to assess them in CAMS. And that's worked very well. And we're trying to encourage more people to do that. What we do, if it's from social services, for example, we're just starting to get, um, we we'll do a quick assessment over the phone and get the um, referral sent into the team and we'll assess them that same day. We do not leave children if they need to be seen. So who sits under that remit? So any child that has ongoing suicidal thoughts um, with a degree of planning or intent, because we know a lot of children can say, I'm going to kill myself or, you know, um, other, other words that we will all be familiar with. But these are the children that have got a plan or an intent to kill or have got something in place that we know is very serious. Severe self-harm causing possible life to risk. Now, those can be anything from children taking medication to in inhaling solvents to anything that they can inhale that puts their life at risk. Um, or a child we had the other day um, threatening to jump off a bridge. Um, one child running in front of cars. Um, so it can be anything like that where the child really does mean that he doesn't want to be alive. Also, one of the things we have to look out for is a possible psychotic presentation. And that's something that not everybody's familiar with. So if you're not sure and you think a child is psychotic or they've got psychotic symptoms, then if you give us a call, either the duty worker or one of the ICAMS workers can talk to you and talk through the symptoms and help you understand whether it is psychosis or not, or whether it's something else. But that's for us to do our assessment, a quick assessment, and then for us to assess the child ourselves. 
and that's normally when we bring a, a medic on board to assess uh, help assess the child to make sure we have the the correct diagnosis if we need to give one later on young people who are planning to be discharged from tier four now just so you're all aware tier four is an inpatient setting that when children are psychotic or very ill or children that have tried to um, commit suicide a number of times or children that have um, had a problem within their environment but it's due to mental health issues sometimes we put them into what we call a tier four to look into their mental health problems and just to assess them on the ward and try and um, stabilize the medication that they may be on what the ICAMS team do is liaise with the tier four placements and those of you that are aware of the tier four placements we have lots of different placements some that deal with eating disorders some that deals with psychosis behavior so we won't just place a child in any tier thought for placement a lot of thought goes into it to see what placements the most appropriate unfortunately on the odd occasion we just have to go for the next bed but we do try not to do that what ICAM's job is is to support any child that is going to be admitted to a tier four one is to try and prevent it trying to give as much support in the community as possible so that we can stop that from happening or to put a, a robust plan in place with the tier four clinicians so we can get the child back into the community as soon as possible the idea is we want to keep children in the homes in the environments they know and support the child at home and the families and other people who are supporting that child to make sure that the child feels safe in their environment. Individuals with significant risk profile who are deteriorating. Now, you're probably well aware, a lot of you, that due to COVID, we've had a real spike in these type of children that which are at significant risk, that at first, due to COVID, they were quite calm in the home environment. They are no, now thinking about going back to school. The anxiety, the risk inside them is escalating. So those are the children we're really trying to touch base with straight away to try and stop the deterioration in their mental health. And this also includes children with ASD. ASD, because of the change in routine and structure, has been a really difficult time for them. So it's about trying to get in and put some structure back into their lives so that when they do return to school um, it's more helpful and the transitions plotted out with them and they understand what's going on and just to add to that i mean a lot of things that we've been doing recently is training and development because of children and covid and them understanding and a lot of children with severe ocd have come to the front um, children not wanting to leave the home because of the anxiety attached to um, the COVID-19 um, that's going on at this time. Next slide, please. Is that a different one, sorry? Oh yeah, that's the same one. <clears throat> Can you just go over the GP priority pathway, Jackie? Yeah, yep, yeah. okay. So that's sorry, sorry, it didn't come up till just OK. So service information relating to DSH. So um, as we've mentioned, deliberate self-harm referrals can be received directly from Ward 21 up to 4 p.m. weekdays, which is 6 p.m. at the moment. And weekends, we're accepting them later as well. That's just during COVID times. Um, any identified ICAMS clinician will be available seven days a week. We have two on duty every single day. So um, if one's in the home doing a home visit, there's always somebody available in CAMS or on the ward. OK, one of the other things is some people get a little bit frustrated with us when we're not assessing a child on the ward. Um, and it's good for people to understand that we have to make sure that children are medically fit to be assessed. So if children have taken a severe overdose and they have to go on Parvalex, 
that means we can't assess until the child has finished their, their treatment and then we'll go in and assess as soon as they are what we class as medically fit. Um, is, do I need to go through it all? Because I know we're running out of time, aren't we? OK, I think it might be good to do about the GP priority pathway. Um, where a GP ha has made a referral and there is a, an indication of serious self-harm or suicidal ideation, what we look at is an expression of wanting to die. Serious attempt to self-harm, ongoing history of being one that's really um, showing it's severe self-harm with a history of admissions, a serious risk to self or others, and is high risk of admission to either A&E or Tier 4. I think the other thing just to mention there is CSE as well. Um, we've noticed during COVID, CSE and when there's domestic violence in the home, so they're all ones, if any of these things are attached, is to please refer into CAMS. Um, so that's when ICAMS will pick up, do the priority, and they will do their own assessment to um, do the traffic light sim symbol to tell us whether it's um, severe or not enough for ICAMS. If it isn't, that's when it will go on to our generic waiting list to be picked up when it's the more appropriate time. As Zoe touched on earlier, we have to prioritise all our, all our cases and this is the reason we have to prioritise them. These are the children that are our main concern that we have to get in and start the work straight away so we don't see a deterioration and we do as much as we can stop them going into tier four where sometimes they're away from the families for a long time and the families have to travel to see them. Um, and ICAMS will continue to support that person until they feel it's fit to do so, which will mean they will join with a tier three clinician or other external agencies until they feel that their, their time to back out of that piece of work is relevant and they let everybody know. What they new, normally do is a care plan to share with everybody, making sure that one, the young person understands the care plan, the parents do, and it's a, a care plan that's been shared with all of them and we're all in agreement with that. OK, next one, Zoe. OK, so we just thought it would be helpful for you, to, for you all to have the um, CAMS contact deta details and the email address. Now, the email address is one that's um, looked at quite frequently within the daytime. It's one that we use for um, external agencies. So if they've got a concern or if they want to call back or they want to ask us about a particular child, then that's the email address to send to. And as I said, that will then be picked up by duty and somebody from duty will then contact you and talk to you to talk about the child or the children or other concerns that you may have. OK, now, as Zoe explained at the beginning, that is a real snapshot of the team. It's a massive team. It really is. So um, in half an hour, it's impossible to go through everything, but we hope you've been able to give you a flavour of what the team what the team do and what we're there to do and how we can support. Thank you. I'm just going to have a look, see if we've got any questions. I don't think we have actually. Um, yeah, if anybody's got any questions that they want to ask, you can just pop them into the chat or even if you want to raise your hand um, and the, the guys will be happy to answer for you. I'm absolutely amazed we've had no neurodevelopmental questions. <laughs> and that might be a good thing just to say about it, if that's all right, Kerry, just to say that yeah. because Zoe's right, because children, we have a lot of children referred in for our, diagno for our diagnostic teams, ASD and ADHD. During COVID, we haven't been able to do the normal routine that we would and the assessments that we complete. We've only just started to do them again, but obviously we've had to do risk assessments for every patient coming into clinic. 
where some of the times the parents can't even come in, they have to wait in the car. So we are trying to tackle that if anybody wants to know about those assessments. But obviously the, you do need to bear with us because our priority is to keep the patients and our staff safe, uh, but still to continue as best as we can. Um, unfortunately, um, a lot of the children, if they're going through a diagnosis, don't like us to wear masks. So we're having to use visors and there's risks about using visors. So uh, we've really had to adapt our way of working. So we are asking people to understand that. So they, if they're talking to families, they can re reiterate that to the families as well, um, which, which is disappointing to us. But I think mm -hmm. we've got to, in this day and age, be very careful for our, everybody. Yeah, um, and we've had a comment here, not quite a question. Um, this is from Beblish, but it's not a question, but I've noticed the service has changed over the years and your team has made a huge difference to the young people I work with and your communication has been excellent. So that's lovely feedback there and a nice oh, comment from yes. Beverly. Um, Thank you for that, Beverly. Yeah, so we have got a couple more minutes. Thank anybody... you so much. It's nice to get... Can I just say, Carrie, yeah, it's nice sure. to get good feedback because... You know, what we're trying to do is work with everybody um, and even if it's not so good, let's address it. But it's lovely to get good feedback then because I don't think we're good at complimenting each other, are we? And yet we all do a fabulous job. And I think at times like this, we need to remember that. But, it, but it's also key to say as well that we don't get everything right all the time. You know, and it's also really important that people tell us when we don't get things right as well. And we can adapt and change things accordingly. Yes. OK, um, and yeah, and we just had one more comment as well from Alison. I would look, just like to say thank you. This is the second session I've attended um, and they've been very informative. Um, and again, from Sean, really helpful, informative session. Um, could you please put the previous slide on again? Yeah. Um, so what we'll do is after this session, for anybody wondering, we will send you out the slideshow um, and we'll also send you um, the evaluation that you complete and give us any feedback. Um, if you've got any questions from there, obviously we can pass them on to the team um, and we'll send out any contact details um, as well for the service. Um, with that, and then at that, I don't think there's any other comments. Um, we can always be contacted after this, Kerry, if anybody thinks of anything at a later date. Brilliant. Um, yeah, so I think that's been really helpful. Um, we've had really good feedback there. So, yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank okay. you. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.